All right, welcome to Christian Overcomers, and thank you for joining us for this Bible study. Deuteronomy 8, not by bread alone. This chapter is going to teach us a very important concept, a concept that Americans must relearn and apply if we are to remain free and blessed. But um, before we get into what this concept is, let us open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just pray for wisdom and understanding in this eighth chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. And um, we pray that we can take this wisdom um, to help us grow and mature as your servants so that, uh, we, can, so that we can be of uh, more use to you in spreading the message of your kingdom. In Yeshua, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, please turn with me, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Verse 1, and it reads, All the commandments which I command thee this day you shall observe to do, now check this out, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. You know, what's kind of interesting here is, see, the uh, Israelites were just, they were standing on the other side of Jordan right now. Um, just awaiting to enter into the promised land. And when they were to get there, God says, hey, I want you to keep my commandments and observe everything that I tell you to do so that you can uh, have, a, have a blessed life, so that you can live and multiply. Now, what a lot of people forget to, uh, or they overread here is God wanted them to multiply. They wanted to Israel, he wanted the Israelites to increase in numbers. It's part of the Abrahamic covenant that God said to Abraham that uh, his descendants would be as numerous as the uh, um, stars of heaven and as the sand of the sea. That's, that's the covenant he made with them. That was the, uh, that's what his desires were for that nation. That's what his desire is for Christian America today. But you know what? Now, instead of Christians, um, I, I should say it this way, instead of Israelite Christians in America today, the descendants of those who founded this great nation are becoming few in number because of, uh, because of um, irresponsible immigration policies and irresponsible policies concerning um, uh, illegal immigration. You know, we've got a blog uh, titled the, I think it's titled the Locust Invasion of 1965, when our immigration laws were changed to upset the ethnic balance of America. Oh, I can hear it right now. Somebody's getting upset. What are you talking about? Are you a racist? No, I'm not. But when God has plans for, for certain peoples, just like he does, like the plan he has for the Israelites, those 10 lost tribes that migrated north over the Caucasus Mountains, who were later renamed Caucasians, who spread throughout Europe after they heard the voice of the shepherd. Uh, they built Christian nations and kingdoms. And again, they later crossed over that Atlantic Ocean to build this, this, uh, the greatest nation that's ever existed upon the face of the earth. That's not an accident. We were being blessed because we could because our founders were trying to follow God's commandments. Um, but anyways, you know that's that's a huge problem we have right now. We are violating the command to go in and multiply. You look at uh, I think it was this year actually that Israelite babies for the first time in, in, in American history, um, became under four, uh, became under 50% of the total of all babies born in America. And I think it was 49 uh, Israelite Christians. Well, I shouldn't even say Christians. Israelites, period, in America, only make up 49% of new babies being born now, this year. <clears throat> okay, well, 
And that, in part, is because we violated God's commandments. We're not following his instructions. Um, verse 2, Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. God is saying, hey, I want you to remember every path that you guys took, every lesson you learned on the way. To humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. That's what it was all about. When you read the book of Exodus or the book of Numbers and you see God leading that nation through the wilderness, he was teaching them lessons. He was educating them. He was humbling them. As we're going to find out, he was making them realize that they must be dependent upon him. Not upon self, not upon Egypt or some other kingdom, not upon government. Like so many of our people are today. Oh, if something happens, we want FEMA to save us. What, what about God? What about prayer? What about helping neighbors? rather than putting our trust in FEMA or the president of the United States. Hey, we don't, you know, the, we don't, we're not supposed to trust in the president to save us. Nor should we count on the president to save us. We put our trust in God. So God is saying, hey, I want, this is a command, thou shalt remember we are supposed to learn from history. We are supposed to learn from even uh, our own lives. When we look back and we see how God has dealt with us, the lessons he taught us, uh, you know, all since, uh, ever since our youth. You know, the, the saying goes, those who do not learn from the past or learn from history will repeat it. They're foolish. They'll repeat the same mistakes over and over and over again. They never grow. They never mature. They just keep going around and around in circles. But that's why God brought them out there. He was, he was testing their heart. He was disciplining them. He was teaching them, instructing them. Think about this. He was grabbing millions of people out from the midst of another kingdom, another nation, from Egypt, and preparing them for battle, preparing them for war. He was, he was building a kingdom out in the wilderness, a kingdom that was, that was going to have a great deal of responsibility, a people that were supposed to be a, a light and an example unto the world. This was a big deal. That takes a lot of training, a lot of discipline, a lot of instruction. Even just, just for the fact of the, um, the military aspect of it. I mean, they were going to have to go in, as we learned from la the, the last chapter, they were, have to, they were going to have to go in and conquer seven nations greater and mightier than them. Nations that, that had giants there. The descendants of the Nephilim, of which I believe we're going to get back in and talk uh, a little bit more about in chapter 9. But this is what life is all about. God wants to humble us, to prove us, to test us, and he will do so in our daily life. And you know what, my friends? There is another, just as the Israelites were 40 years in the wilderness... I believe we're moving back towards that wilderness period of trial and testing once again. America is being tested. We're learning our lessons. We have a president that, that's, uh, that's pathetic. And I think we're learning our lessons of what kind of leadership we'll get if we ignore God. And we'll find that, um, and if you want to make a note of Revelation chapter 12, there is that time when the woman's brought into the wilderness once again. 
the Israelites. And God feeds them there, protects them there. So hey, when, when things start getting crazy around us, and they could get crazier after this election, either way, we'll see. Um, but, uh, well, here we go. The God, God wanted to test him to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. Hey, we're tested at times in our personal lives. God wants to know, hey, are they going to listen to me? Are they going to keep my commandments? Or are they going to say, well, I don't want to keep that commandment or I don't want to talk about that commandment because it, it offends my neighbor. It offends my, my aunt, my uncle, my brother, my sister, a loved one, because, because um, it, it, it tells me what they're doing is wrong. But I don't want to, I, I don't, I'm kind of offended about that because I, I don't want them to not like me. That's a test, my friend. In other words, one, one test that many families go through today is a lot of families, um, it seems anymore, um, has a, has a, has a member that's, uh, a homosexual or a lesbian. I guess that fits both categories. Homosexual does. But then they look at God's word and they say, well, I want to soften that um, because uh, I don't want my family member to think I'm hateful or that I don't love them. You know, you don't have to go and, and give your family member a hard time or make a scene or or make a point, just live a Christian life and stand up for what's right. It doesn't mean we compromise. And it doesn't mean we have to, um, uh, to you know, do something or say something directly to them uh, that's, uh, that we don't need to. But it does mean that when uh, states um, vote put up a vote of whether or not we should allow gay marriage. Hey, Chris, it's a Christian's duty to show up at the polls and check that box saying I'm a marriage that marriage should be only between one man and one woman. Because if we don't do that, we don't what are we? What good are we? We're supposed to be uh, we're supposed to make a difference on this earth. We're supposed to be the salt of the earth. Again, those, those tests come in many ways. God wants to know, hey, is this, is this child obedient? Will they listen to me? Can I use them? Because look at what God was doing and take this on a national level as well as a personal level. Because God wanted to know whether or not he could use the Israelites for this important task of, of advancing his kingdom. Just as he wants to know if each and every one of you has the heart of a servant, has a heart that's obedient, so that, uh, so that he knows whether or not he can use you. That's what, that's, that's what he's looking for. Verse 3, he humbled thee. means he brought you low. He, he, made, uh, he made them think, think about things. And you know what? Many of us, um, well, let, let's just read here and we'll talk about it. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger. Okay, he, he put them to the test a little bit. Hey, life isn't going to just be, you know, some people cry out when uh, uh, something bad happens to them because, hey, after all, I'm a Christian. Nothing bad should happen in my life. It should just go perfect. That's not the case, my friends. The, the, the main thing God is trying to do is he's trying to build a kingdom. He's trying to save souls. And he needs people that can help him in, in doing that, to help carry forth his plan. And he can't just use anybody. He has to use trusted servants, skilled servants, servants who, uh, who will humble themselves and, and not um, have too much pride or arrogance but that will rely upon God. Servants that will say, Lord, take me, sh show me how to serve you. Search my heart and show me those parts um, in my heart that are, that are lacking, that need improvement. Help me to grow. I want to serve you. I love you. 
I love my brothers and sisters. I just want to do whatever I can to help them. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna. What is manna? The word manna actually means what's that? Because that's what the Israelites said when they looked up and saw it uh, falling from the sky. They say, what's that? It's, it's, um, you could define it as, I guess, um, supernatural bread coming from heaven. Heavenly bread. Heavenly food. And um, so here we go. Which thou knewest not, you didn't know what it was, neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know. Now check this out. This verse here is probably one of the most important verses in the Bible, if not the most important verse. It is one of the verses that Christ quoted to Satan in Matthew chapter 4, um, Matthew chapter 4, verse 4 to be exact. When Satan asked Christ, hey, if you're really the son of God, make these stones into bread. Prove it to me. But look at what, uh, here's what Christ quoted. Here are the words Christ quoted here. And this is what I talked about in the introduction. This is the concept. A basic concept, but most important concept that we must relearn and apply in America because it's been forgotten. And here it is. That he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. D never forget that. You'll hear us close with that after almost every study. Because this is what's important. You know, a lot of people say, I've read, oh, I've already read the Bible through and through. I did so in confirmation or, or wherever. That doesn't get it, uh, my friends. We are to live daily by it. It's our daily bread. Studying and learning from it every day. Because you know what? The minute we cut ourselves off from God's word is the minute we start dying. We start falling apart spiritually. You know, it seems like man has it down really good that, you know, we need food to live and survive. We can understand that because our belly gets hungry and we say, hey, I got to get something to eat. I'm going to die. But it seems that man cannot seem to grasp that we need to take God's word. We need to study it and absorb it. And put it into our minds so that we can truly live. Because your flesh body can live and you can be walking around, but uh, you're, you're the walking dead. If you don't have God's words in your mind and in your soul and in your heart. A lot of people say, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus Christ, but do you study his word? Or do you just say, I'm, I'm saved and I believe? Or all we got to do is love one another. Well, how do you love one another if you don't know what the commandments are? Because I'll tell you this, all t the, the Ten Commandments that outline the 600 plus of God's laws, uh, they instruct us, God's laws instruct us how to love God, number one, and how to, love, how to love our neighbor. But yet many Christians today say, oh, I don't do the Old Testament anymore. I don't need to study that. I, I just love. Well, who do you love? How do you love? And how do you define what you're doing is actually loving? When you don't have the words within you. This is so important because this is why America is suffering today. Hey, we're saying, well, we can do it on our own. We've, we've not humbled ourselves to realize that we must depend upon Almighty God. You know what? In fact, the Declaration of Independence it, you know, is the founding document of this great nation. It declared independence from tyranny. But at the same time, the thing that we're not really taught 
in, well, especially in schools, our public school system, is that that document declared dependence to Almighty God. The whole, the whole document was um, a list of grievances um, that, that uh, the early Americans were, um, were, were uh, putting down in a legal, in like a legal format that was addressed to Almighty God. They're saying, hey, the King of Britain, he's doing this to us. He's doing that to us. Please help us. Plead our cause. Rescue us. We depend upon you. And they did it right. They did it right. You know, there's one thing I, I, I think they, they may have went a little weak on perhaps. Maybe they had too much trust and faith in the people. And that is the fact of the, uh, the, the um, Freedom of Religion Amendment. The idea that our founders had when they had the, the, the right to uh, or the freedom of religion was that they, they, they considered us to be a Christian nation. Not a Buddhist nation, not a Hindu nation, not a Muslim nation, not a secular nation but a Christian nation made up of Christian peoples. And they wanted all Christians to be able to worship and serve God according to whichever denomination they wanted to, um, to be a part of. But um, nevertheless, I think they did leave somewhat of a gaping hole there um, that they probably could have put some stronger language in the Constitution about is, is to keep this a Christian nation. To uh, somewhat restrict other nations from coming in here and replacing our God and putting their gods in place and changing our laws and putting their laws in place. Well, we'll probably get to that here a little bit more, but let's, let's talk about this again. You know, in our personal lives, I mean, we, we really cannot live and truly be happy without the Word of God. You know, when, you, when you're around people that study God's Word, you, you feel this, this energy, this life about them. Especially when you're among a whole group of Christians. I'm not talking about just going into a church building. That doesn't matter. I'm talking about going somewhere where you're around a bunch of people who hunger for God's Word. It feels so alive. And then you see somebody, even in a local church, that just goes there and doesn't study God's Word. And you just feel this, this, this coldness, this, this deadness. And that's not judging, that's just a fact. Because, the, because of this statement here, that's, um, that is a fact. It's a, it's a command and a fact that man cannot live by material food alone, but he must learn and absorb every word of God. Every word. That's why we study it chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Um, because this is what he tells us to do. You know, I, I'm thinking about this. Christ was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights when, when the devil came up to him and told him to make those stones into bread. And this is what he quoted back to Satan. In a sense, you know, it would have been really easy for him to, to, you know, to listen to his stomach and to give in to the flesh. But he wanted to show us that we must overpower the flesh. We must take ourselves out in a sense, out of the flesh, in our thinking. And think about the spiritual. Think about what really matters. Because this flesh is just temporal. This is a test. We're, here, we're sent here to see if we can overcome this flesh. This flesh that wants to tug on us and pull us away from God and get us to be selfish and self-consumed. But um, 
in a sense here, what God did with the Israelites as well. Christ fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, but God brought the Israelites on sort of a 40-year fast, a fast from the world. He separated them from almost completely from the world. Out there alone where he could teach them and instruct them. Fascinating, fascinating when you think about it. Thy raiment, verse 4, thy raiment, what your clothes wax not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. God took care of them. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son or instructs and disciplines his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. You know, this is different than judgment. God sometimes judges nations. And mainly that's that judgment, yes, it's done to teach lessons and so forth, but mainly it's done to satisfy justice. Because uh, when you commit a crime, you must pay the price to make things right, to pay retribution. But when God's instructing his own child, it's, it's, it's um, teaching and sometimes punishing to make that child or to put that child in a place where he's useful. He's not, um, well, I should say he's not worthless. But that's, that's what's fascinating is he, God, Almighty God is our Heavenly Father. And just as we chasten our, our children, we instruct them, we teach them, we discipline them. God does it in our lives. And hey, if you're not learning from it, if you're not looking at your life and realizing what God might be doing to you with the circumstances around you, that he's trying to shape and mold you, then you're, a, then you're sort of a rebellious child. And if any of you parents out there, you know, that's the last thing you want is a rebellious child. When your children start rebelling against you, it's the time you step in and you say, hey, you better listen up. Or you're going to be in big trouble. And also, you better listen up. Otherwise, you're going to destroy yourself and others around you. That's why we teach our, our children. That's why God teaches and instructs his children. Hey, look, that we, as we found out from the last chapter, the Israelites were supposed to be, when they go in this land, they are supposed to be a royal priesthood. That is a high position in God's kingdom. And with it comes a great deal of responsibility. Verse, um, excuse me, th verse 6, Therefore uh, thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. Um, you know, a lot of people, when they look at this word fear, they think they were supposed to just tremble from God. No, fear actually means to respect, to revere, and to love. But it, it does. It does mean fear in the sense that um, we're supposed to fear the consequences of our disobedience. We're supposed to know that, hey, God's going to spank us. But that's... Uh, that's what he says here. That's what we're supposed to do is thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. You know, I marvel when people, and, and, and I just sometimes I can't understand this mode of thinking. But anyways, I marvel when people say that, well, we don't want God's law instituted in America. We don't want to force people to follow God's law, his commandments. Well, don't you want to be blessed? Because I tell you what, if you don't want uh, God's law enforced as the law of the land, you're going to live by a different law. Because, the, here, I'll put it this way. Laws are inescapably religious in nature because they define or they choose which, um, um, well, I should say it this way, they define which laws are... How am I going to put this here? They say, basically, a law. what a law does is it protects certain morals and values. Well, where do those morals and values come from? They, they come from, they come from a, a belief system. Well, 
It just so happens that our belief system is the, is the word of God. Where you go to the communist, uh, well, the ex-communist Soviet Union, but they're still communist over there, or any other communist nation, what are their beliefs and values? What's their book? Well, they go by secular humanism and other things. I guess what I'm saying is, hey, America already enforces laws. It's just our choice of whether or not we want to live by God's law or the law of some tyrannical government or some false religion that oppresses its people. Laws are religious by nature. That's just the way it is. And... Um, well, here we go. Let's continue on. Verse 6, thou, there, um, well, we're, we're going to reread that. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. That's what they were supposed to do, do in the land. That was first and most important. And my friends, that's why America is falling apart today is because we've decided, hey, we don't want to live by God's commandments. We don't... We don't want um, him restricting us from uh, having abortions and gay marriage, among many other things. We want to be free. We want to have liberty. My friends, you're not going to have freedom and liberty. You're going to serve a different master. If what well, I think it was John Adams, he says, um, "Those who will not be governed by God." or by the word of God, will be ruled by tyrants. That's the way it is. They understood these things. Verse 7, For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains, and depths that spring out of the valleys and hills. Now this is what this land of Canaan was like back then. And uh, I want you to look at this and think of America. Because this describes a nation that, um, well, this describes America, um, I, guess, I guess you could say it this way. When you look out at the rest of the world, there is no other nation like America. America is the promised land, the new promised land, so to speak. And here we go, verse 7, For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land. A land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of the valleys and the hills. A land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates. A land of oil, olive and honey. A land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Thou shalt not lack anything in it. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills Thou mayest dig brass. You're going to have, a, have an abundance of natural resources. But this is what God says. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he giveth thee. God gave us this land. But you know what? What's important to realize is you look at these lists of things... Um, these lists of things God said he would give us, these things we were supposed to take and use as blessings, not for our own personal use only or for our own goals and ambitions. But God gave this great land, this blessed land, as part of his covenant to the Israelites so that they would, uh, so that they would perform their duties and responsibilities of advancing the kingdom. God's kingdom. So, that you know, you want to know why we have these things in America today. It's not because God just wants to flourish us with, uh, with all kinds of niceties and, you know, pamper us so that we're spoiled, rotten brats. No. He wants us to have these things so that we can more easily do his work and be comfortable doing his work. To be that superpower, to be strong, to be able to protect ourselves from enemies around us. And that's what the purpose was, my friends. And so what we have here is, and you'll find out in Luke chapter 12, verse 48, to whom much is given, much is expected. 
We're not supposed to just live like the prodigal son and spend endlessly like we do today. We're supposed to take these resources and use them for the benefit of the kingdom, as well as for a little personal enjoyment, but more importantly, for the kingdom. Um, well, okay, well, we got that. He says, when thou art eaten, thou art full, you should thank God. We, we should always thank God for all of our blessings. Verse 11, beware. Here's where we come to the point of a warning that we didn't take heed to. And we've got, now we have a president that's destroying our nation and many other leaders as well. But here we go. Beware, lest thou forget not the Lord thy God. You know, when you're eating and you're, you know, when you're full and you've got, a, um, and you've got everything going your way, it's the most vulnerable time for you because it's so easy to forget about God and say, hey, we got this great, uh, we got all this wealth and these blessings by our own hands, by our own ingenuity. But you know what? God gave us the brain. He gave us the hands and he gave us the land. We couldn't do anything if it wasn't for him. And the lesson of this chapter is that we must realize that everything we have comes from God. We are totally and completely dependent upon Him. We would have nothing without Him. Yes, we're not supposed to tell Him to do everything for us. We're supposed to work hard and be smart. But at the same time, we're supposed to realize where all these things come from. God made this earth. We couldn't do it without his materials. Beware lest thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. This is the one. This is why I can't understand why people say diversity makes us strong in America. We must support uh, and defend freedom of religion. I don't want to live by Islam. I don't want to live by secular, secular humanism. Why do I want to defend that? Why is that so great? It, God never says that in the Bible, that that's so great, that that's one of the highest values we should hold and protect is uh, freedom of religion. Yeah, we can't force people to love God, but we can force them to live by His laws if they want to live in this country. Because his laws protect our freedom and our liberty. The moment we forget him and forget his commandments is the moment we start losing our freedom, my friends. Where have we been brainwashed into this, uh, let's all just get together and blend together. Hey, you worship this God, you worship that God, and I worship this God, and we're going to build this great civilization. That's not what our founders intended. It was a Christian freedom, a, a freedom to worship God according to whichever denomination you were a part of. They were uniting under Christ, in other words, under his, under his word as best they could. And, and, you know, obviously they weren't perfect. But you know what? Uh, and I feel part of the reason they left this gaping hole in there for us, just like the Israelites of old did later on, by with this tolerance stuff that's going on today is that um, they were fleeing from lands where religious hypocrites had you know, um, gotten high up above the people and started persecuting people. Not because they weren't following God's word, but because they weren't following that church system. And when the uh, early Americans got here, they said, hey, I don't want people in government burning me to the stake because I don't follow their denomination to the letter. We don't want that. And I completely understand that. I don't want some religious hypocrite. Hey, and I, I have religious hypocrites that probably would burn me to the stake for certain things that I teach, like the serpent seed. And, uh, and that I don't teach the rapture. There are people that are crazy nuts 
That if they had power, they would burn people to the stake like me who teach things like that. And I don't want that. But I do want us to follow God's commandments. And I do think our Constitution should have been a little bit stronger when it came to that. I do think if, if we were wise, we would make an amendment. Phasing out these other religions. How would we do that? I'm not really sure exactly. I haven't really thought about it because I don't think our people will even would even consider it. People would think I'm crazy for even saying such a thing because they think this diversity is wonderful. Even many people who profess to be conservatives will defend that. Hey, we ought to have free choice of religion. Okay, well then what laws are we going to follow? Because laws come from religious values and morals. Are we going to follow humanism and become a communist nation? Or are we going to follow Christianity and be a Christian nation and live free and blessed? Or are we going to allow Islamic law to, to replace our law? You see, it's, it's, uh, it, it's nonsense when people talk like that. We've lost touch with God's word. Again, I love the Constitution of the United States, but it's not completely perfect. The, my main document is this Constitution. That's what I defend over and above all. Hey, if something violates this covenant, then I don't want to, uh, to uh, follow that over this. No way. This is it. This is where all other um, government uh, documents and constitutions are supposed to come from. In fact, that's where our Constitution, uh, this, our Constitution was built on the Word of God. Not perfectly, but to, well, I guess I should say probably the best that any other republic has ever been. Okay, so God says, beware, don't do that. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and thou hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein. Um, you know, you, you look at how people are today. You know, we, we have all these houses and these blessings today. But, uh, but there's not a lot of churches out there. that are, uh, Bible teaching churches that are, that are supported by people in America. You know, you look at uh, some of the, the viewership of, um, of churches that teach God's word versus uh, churches that tell people what they want to hear. Sometimes it's pretty lopsided because people like to have their ears tickled. But, um, well, anyways, enough of that. Anyways, and, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply... And thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou thou hast is multiplied, just like it was. You, you look back in, at the 90s and so forth. Then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. He, he brought you out of slavery, and now you're going to forget him? You're gonna, your heart's going to be lifted up? In other words, you're going to be, you're going to have... Uh, Pride build up, pride build build up within you. You're gonna allow that to happen. You know what? Pride is the worst sin that we can possibly have because it was pride that uh, destroyed Satan. He thought he didn't need God. He didn't need to live by every word of the Lord. He could live by his own words, his own ways. His own intelligence, his own skills. You know what? Somebody who um, is not humble before God is somebody who's not teachable. God can't use them. In fact, that's the first step in being a servant of Almighty God is, is to be humble. To look at yourself and to know, hey, man, I, I screw up all the time. If it wasn't for God's grace and forgiveness, you know, where would I be? 
Lord, help me be stronger. You know, we need to humble ourselves at times so that God can teach us and use. And that means to look at our heart, to look at those areas that uh, well, sometimes we think are perfect. And then when we really look at it, we say, oh, I got a little issue there. You know, I'm a, it, uh, I, don't, I can't think of any examples I want to use offhand, but um, it's not that I don't have any examples that I need to search my heart for. But, you know, those things are kind of private to people. They know they have their own weaknesses and they don't need to tell it to the world, but they work on them. They work on them. Uh, a humble person does anyways. But from the book of Proverbs, the uh, beginning of knowledge is the fear or reverence of the Lord. To humble yourself. That's where it begins. Verse 15, who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein there were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of the flint. Of flint. That he fed them, um, he protected them and fed them water in the desert. You know, you look at what they went through, all these uh different poisonous serpents and scorpions. This, this wasn't a, a pretty place to be. And you could imagine how exciting it was for the Israelites to look over at that promised land as compared to what they were living in for 40 years. That testing ground, that, that time of trial. Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee and that he might approve thee to do thee good at thy latter end. Now, I'm going to throw in something for the deeper student. In Revelation chapter 2, uh, verse 17, it is written there that the overcomers will, um, um, they will uh, inherit or they will be given right to eat the hidden manna. Think about that. Look that up and read that. You know, you look at uh, the manna, it's the supernatural bread from heaven. It, this, this, that hidden manna is going to be uh, something else. Do we know what it is right now? No, we don't. Because it, it, it's not just the Word of God. Because the Word of God is, um, is not hidden. Yes, there are parables and mysteries and so forth that, that may be a part of that. But uh, that's something in the future for the overcomers um, that they will receive. And, we, and we'll find out then at that time. Um, but anyways, he, God fed them there. He protected them to, and proved them so that they would be useful. Verse 17, And thou say in thine heart, My power and the might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. That is not what we want to say. You know what? This reminds me of a statement Barack Obama made recently. And um, I guess I would say in part it, it was in part it was true. You know, he looked at uh, when he was talking about business owners, he said, you didn't build that. Well, they did build it, but they didn't build it alone. They built it with God's blessings, with his resources that he gave us as well as the, their brain and their, and their talents and, and abilities. But uh, the part where Barack Obama had it wrong was that he was saying that the government, the government built those businesses for them because the government built roads and all these types of things. But you know what? See, you, what you have there is a stark contrast. You have a man that believes that government is the source of all of our blessings. When it is Almighty God, that is. That, my friend, is the definition of this verse where God says, don't you say in your heart that my might, my strength has gotten me this wealth. That's what he's talking about. It's not the government. It's not, a, 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 you know, an elite of people. It's Almighty God. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he sware unto thy fathers unto this day. Again, we must remember, and the whole theme of this is, is that we are totally 
dependent upon God. We're dependent on every word of his, every instruction of his to lead and to guide our lives. And that's what God was trying to teach them. Hey, you need me. Without me, you're going to destroy yourselves. You need my instruction. You need my blessings. If there's one lesson in life that, that everybody needs to learn, it's this one right here. Because this, this pride and rebellion of saying I can do things without God is making, it, it makes it, you, um, you set yourself up as a God. And that's what Satan did. And this is where we are at in America today. We've thought, oh, well, diversity has gotten us this strength. Tolerance. Our freedom of religion, it's made us great. No, it hasn't. These other religions are, are hurting our country. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. Okay, we read that to establish his covenant with us. So, you know, God, part of God's um, uh, covenant blessings is to give us wealth. There's nothing wrong with wealth as long as we use it properly to advance his kingdom. Verse 19, and it... And it shall be, um, you know, I'm going to talk about this a little bit. That what God is saying, hey, I don't want you to be prideful and think that you can just go and build great civilizations and, and have all these uh, blessings without me. Um, that's important to, to think about. Because a lot of the uh, so-called, we call them neocons today in the Republican Party. They think that, you know, our mission here on earth is to spread democracy around the world. No, it's not. That's never been our biblical mandate to spread democracy around the world. Because what they're trying to do is they're saying, hey, let's just give people a taste of freedom and they're going to love it and have it. No, they're not. Not without the commandments of God. That's the same as building the Tower of Babel. That's, that's being prideful and arrogant, thinking, hey, if we got this perfect system that we can have other people fall, we're going to build this perfect world. No, we are not. Hey, our mandate, it, yeah, it sounds nice. We want to free people around the world and we want them to have uh, uh, liberty. But we can only do so by advancing God's kingdom, spreading his truth and his commandments to areas that will accept it, other nations, other peoples. So in other words, what I, sh what I could say, our mandate is to spread the gospel of the kingdom, not to spread democracy. God could care less about democracy. There's times where God had a kingdom, uh, kingdoms in place. It's not the form of government that we worship. It's that we worship God and follow his commandments. And it just so happens that God's government is a kingdom, a representative uh, republic even, if you would, with God as its king. Okay, well... I think we were on verse, uh, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. Okay, verse 19. And it shall be, if thou do it all, forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. What is this? Walk after other gods and worship them. That's diversity, my friends. That's multiculturalism. Those are the things God said, hey, if you do those things, you shall utterly perish. That's why I say the, the First Amendment of freedom of religion was not meant to be freedom of every, any and every religion because that's a death trap, my friends. Because if we want to, to uh, define it as being for every religion other than Christianity, then we're putting our nation to death. We're committing suicide. Because God said again here, if you walk after other gods, you follow secular humanism. You look at these other religions and say, hey, yours is great too. 
and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. You're going to be destroyed. And America is perishing today, my friends, because of this. Our children are being taught pagan religions in school. And the Ten Commandments are being ripped out. And we're perishing. Because we haven't heeded our lesson of humbling ourselves. And realizing we are dependent upon God. Even our founding document declares it so. Even our motto, we are one nation under God. Not one nation under many gods or many nations under many gods. In diversity. Interfaith. Coexist. As the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face, so shall you perish, because you would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. That comes before all else. Again, I'm a firm believer in the Constitution. I think it was great that godly men came together and were inspired by God to, to, to frame that document. But if it leaves gaping holes for us to, to cause us to violate this one thing, the first and great commandment, then it needs to be fixed. There needs to be an amendment. I'm not saying we're supposed to, that we want to, you know, um, burn people at the stake for not being a Baptist, a Presbyterian, a Catholic, or whatever. I'm not advocating one specific denomination, I'm saying we need to follow God's word, his laws. That Christian overcomers is not a part of any denomination. I don't really like denominations because they're like political parties. Hey, you side with us, we have this doctrine and values. No, let God's word do the teaching, the forming, the molding, and so forth. Anyways, what a fascinating chapter. Again, the main lesson of this chapter was that we, we cannot live without God's word. We're, we're dead. And in the eternity, if we do not partake of God's word and put it into our heart, our minds, and our soul, we won't be there, my friends. Because we don't know how to even live or be a citizen of the kingdom without God's words in our mind. It's that simple. Hey, this... Well, it just seems like we just keep getting started. There's just so much in this great book of Deuteronomy. It's the foundation of the entire Bible. It's the constitution of, our, of, of, our, of God's kingdom. It's the constitution that supersedes all other constitutions. And it is wonderful. It is perfect. It is just. It is righteous. So, see that you stay in God's word. Study it every single day, if at all possible. And again, do like what Christ said in Matthew chapter 4, when tempted of the devil, and like we just read here, and study God's word, for man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So see that you um, partake of it, consume it, meditate upon it, so that you can be a Christian Overcomer. Christian Overcomers is brought to you by the tithes and offerings of our listeners. If you'd like to donate, you can do so by going to ChristianOvercomers.com. God bless you and thank you for your support.